Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Tracy Harris. Welcome back. Hey. And uh, Tracy Harris and her magical jars, which we'll get to here in a little while. Um, we are live. Today is Sunday, February 22nd, 2009. Um, the Atheist Experience is a television program uh, on public access TV, sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. I almost forgot what we were and <laughs> where, you know, what's going on. We are what we are. We are live, in case you couldn't tell by uh, all the mess ups. Um, we're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization that promotes positive atheism and the separation of church and state. The AACA has weekly meetings every Sunday at Romeo's on Barton Strings Road beginning at around 11.30, except for the first Sunday of the month when we host a lecture series at the Austin History Center located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe, all here in beautiful Austin. Uh, there won't be a lecture uh, for March. Um, and there's more information about that at the website. For more information about the ACA, you can go to the website www.atheist-community.org. There's more information on the group. There's also a frequently asked questions page. There's a contact form. There's uh, information about discussion groups and email lists. Anybody who doesn't get through on the telephone today or doesn't want to, or if you're listening to one of the, the archived versions of this, you can email tv at atheist-community.org. That goes to myself, the co-host, some of the people behind the scenes as well. Um, we will be taking live calls, we always do, uh, primarily from the Austin area, although now we are streaming the show over the internet, so we do get some calls from outside of Austin, and I'm expecting possibly one return call this week. Um, we're not quite sure if that's actually going to happen because there was a birthday and some confusion over times, um, but if it does, it does, and, and if not, we'll, we'll do it another time. The audio portion, portion of this program is available for download and as a podcast. You can go to atheist-experience.com for more information about that. And the video is available currently at Google Video, and the old episodes will remain available there for as long as Google's willing to host them. Um, in the future, there Google plans to stop allowing people to upload videos, in which case, at, at which time we will switch to some other uh, service uh, that allows you to watch the entire program. Clips of the show are being posted by fans. So if you if you caught a clip on YouTube, um, and it's you know a short clip about an argument or a funny call or an intelligent call. If you, if you found that one, let me know. Uh, but um, those are being posted by fans, and they uh, and and in the future we may actually use something like YouTube for that as well. Um, uh, they, they've already posted the announcements on YouTube. I I was semi joking when I suggested that they do that, but at least it's given people the opportunity uh, to head over to the website and find out more about the show, email us, catch up on full episodes, and things like that. In addition to this show, the ACA also sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. That's P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. And you go to nonprofitsradio.com for more information about that. We were live yesterday, and we were live the week before because we skipped a week. Uh, we'll be on again in two weeks. It's hosted by Dennis Lubay, features myself, Russell Glasser, Schilling, and occasionally Thad England. Um, for those of you who weren't aware, the host co-host situation here is now stabilized, and that is that I'm doing three weeks in a row, and then Russell comes in and hosts for a week, and there are five co-hosts that run through the rotation. And so that way everybody gets a chance to do a show with everybody else. Uh, we'll be taking your calls shortly. We'll put the number up um, about the calls. Uh, we appreciate, and I'm not going to say, oh, don't call in to tell us, you know, hey, thanks for the show. Um, we appreciate all that, but I think most of the people uh, who would say, gosh, I love the show, um, really <laughs> like hearing the calls that are, you know, at least um, contentious or a discussion or a debate uh, or maybe an argument or maybe just a stupid why don't we die when the sun goes down. Whatever the case may be, if your call is, hey, this weird thing happened to me uh, and I believe it and you should too, call. Hey, I believe this and you're stupid for not believing it, feel free to call. If it's, hey, I like the show, you guys are doing a good job, call if you can, but let's try and keep some lines open. And today the lines are actually short because I'm locking in one line for for uh, Matt Slick. Um, upcoming events, uh, there's a Godless Pub Crawl, March 6th. That's a Friday, I believe. Yeah, I think it is the Friday. Uh, so it's, it's actually a week from this coming Friday. Um, we're putting together some T-shirts and stuff. Uh, Schilling's organizing it. And for those people who'd like to come and participate and would like a T-shirt, um, you need to get an email in so we can kind of get a head count on how many shirts we need to, to get and have ready. Um, I don't have price information and couldn't give it to you if I had it. Um, we're going to, the, 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 all the information about the event should be available on the website, atheist-community.org. Um, in addition to 
those events and the lecture, we have a number of other events on a regular basis. We have solstice parties and things, but each week we have Atheist Happy Hour at the Dog and Duck Pub every Thursday, beginning around 7 o'clock at the corner of 17th and Guadalupe. Um, any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events. You don't have to be a member to attend, uh, but if you're coming down to preach, proselytize, or provoke, please don't. Just call in or send an email or whatever you need to do. Um, and by the way, regarding email, we can't possibly answer all the email that comes in. It's just not feasible. And I have done everything I can, including, I mean, all of the co-hosts are involved, and we try uh, to answer as many as, as possible. We do read all of them. Um, I've done everything I can t to answer every email that comes in, and it is, I, I kid you not, it's just not possible. Maybe if the only thing I did all week long was answer emails and get ready for the next week's show, um, it might be possible. Unfortunately, I have a job, because uh, we do all this for free, and that sucks up a good chunk of my life, and I like to sleep, um, and I also, uh, I don't know, occasionally like to play games or uh, other things that are entertaining and lighthearted so that I don't lose my damn mind. Uh, but we do appreciate all the email when we read it, and uh, I, I, I like getting the feedback, but don't get all bothered if you sent something that you were just sure was important and sure was going to get response and you didn't hear anything. It's possible, A, that it fell through the cracks because there's, there's some stuff that's lost into the, the spam saving abyss, and uh, it's also possible that one person thought somebody else might address it or, or didn't really see it the way you saw it. But keep the emails coming because as before the show, Matt Torres called in um, from out of town. He had gone to uh, a lecture by Frank Turek on uh, why God exists. And he provided some information to us that we talked about on the nonprofit show. He's also blogging about it. If you want to, you can listen to yesterday's episode of the nonprofits and get more information about his blog and the event. Um, and also the, the atheist community of Topeka folks were up there. And there's more information about that. How you doing? Good. Is your brain melted? Is my brain melted? Not yet. Well, it either is or isn't. That's right. It's melted or it is not melted. We'll get to that eventually. Um, okay. Let's. We're going to take one call real quick before Tracy gets started. We've got Nicholas in Singapore. Hey, Matt. How are you? Good. How you doing? I'm great. This is. I'm calling from Monday morning, 6 a.m. here. Uh, it's Monday morning for you. It's not for me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just so happy to finally be able to talk to you guys. That's I've been weird. watching you on YouTube uh, on past clips, so it's nice to actually watch uh, new shows. All right. Well, I, I, you know, in, in kind of keeping with the new spirit and the fact that we're on limited uh, telephone lines today with a lot to get to, why don't you just go ahead and get to whatever your question is, and we'll see if we can't uh, give you an answer or at least say we don't know. Okay, well, I was, at, I was wondering your opinion on uh, Boethius is the Constellation of Philosophy, where he postulates that God is collective happiness. The kind of what? God is happiness? Yeah, basically, not, God is not a creator. God is, is, uh, is the drive or the okay. collective mind. All oh. men are striving. Right. Okay. You can. You can. You could make anything you want to uh, and label it God, however you want. But th that doesn't mean that you're communicating in any effective way. We already have a word for happiness, and that's um, happiness. happiness. And so, why call happiness God? To me, what this is, and I, I talked about this um, two nonprofits ago um, because Schilling and I had a discussion. This is one of my biggest pet peeves. The, in, in our purpose is to communicate and communicate effectively. Words themselves have no intrinsic meaning or value. They're labels to concepts that we have. And the only way communication can happen is if we're using labels that we both have a similar or near identical understanding of. And so if I tell you that I'm happy and you speak English and you have the same understanding of happy that I do, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. But if I tell you I believe in God, that word has other meanings other than happiness. So by saying that you think, and I'm not, I'm not saying you, obviously, I know you're, you're talking about somebody else's position, but saying that you think God is just happiness or God is love or whatever um, is useless. There's no point in adding that label. And what it does is it tells me that the individual is so enamored of this God label and is infusing this God label itself 
with some intrinsic value that they feel the need to constantly redefine it so that they don't lose that word. Go ahead, lose the word. If it can be redefined to be anything, then it's nothing. It's, it, it's a meaningless construct. Or uh, to me, another way to look at it is just that they're simply being metaphorical. They're, yeah. they're just applying a word, you know, God is happiness, um, you know, my cats are happiness to me. But it, it's like a, a metaphorical thing where you can label something right. as God and just say, to me, this is God, but you're just using it as a metaphor in that case and not as some kind of a, you know, like a materially existent item. Yeah, so it's either metaphor, in which case, congratulations, they're kind of poetic, <laughs> yeah. or they're actually trying to make an existential claim, in which case they're just playing with labels, pointlessly. Well, I, I I think I, I think I agree with the idea that it's a metaphor because it's more than just uh, a happiness that you get with being with your family or, or, or reading a good book or watching a good movie or watching a sunset. It, it's more of a, a collective un, uh, un, unconscious happiness that we're all kind of striving for, uh, but we never quite meet. Good like feelings. that perfect act that all men or, or all, all humans are trying to get to never quite reach. It, 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 so, so it is it is sort of an allegorical metaphorical uh, idea, yeah. but it, it, I think it's, it's more than just calling one thing something else. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't know that there's any disagreement here, and I don't, I don't necessarily have too much more to say on the relabeling of God, but <laughs> uh, I appreciate the call, and I want to go ahead and get started on, on the stuff that Tracy brought in. Um, All right, so, great. Well, thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. Appreciate yeah. it. I should ask him how the weather was in Singapore. That oh, was yeah. that was going to be my shtick, you know. Somebody calls in from oh, outside, so I ask them, how's the, the weather? weather? Right. Oh, you should be in Austin. It's I had, beautiful. you know, I got short sleeves and the, had the air on. <laughs> and I'm wearing a scarf. Yeah, she's but, wearing a scarf yeah. and I'm in short I'm always sleeves. freezing in the studio, though. That's why. It, it, it can get a little chilly in here, All except right. in the summer. So um, Wait, let's do the first chunk. Yeah, then, let's do let's okay. let's get started. So if you're if you're on the line, uh, please hang, hang on, on because we, we want to get started on the subject for today, and you don't necessarily have to talk about that. Okay. Today I brought a model that I made that is uh, meant to demonstrate particular fallacies. And mm -hmm. it, I find it interesting because in my mind this thing demonstrates a load of fallacies. It's not just one. It's like handles a lot of them. And what it, the way these are set up, what they model is in this jar there is existent dice. Can, and can we get zoomed in a little bit? You can see them. It's a jar with dice inside it. <laughs> is there a close-up or is it not working? Know. Okay, and then in the second jar, I have non-existent dice. And in the final jar, I have transcendent supernatural dice. And for the sake of the first I guess game or experiment or a demonstration, we're going to say, we're going to accept that the supernatural transcendent dice, in fact, are existent. So we're going to say that in this jar are supernatural transcendent dice. In this jar is non-existent dice, and in this jar we have existent dice. I was going to bring a kitchen scale, but I think I can describe that part of it without demonstrating it and people will understand what I was going to do, which was to take the dice out of the jar, weigh the jar, put the dice back in the jar, weigh the jar, and demonstrate that the die add weight so that they have mass and weight. But you can also see that they reflect light, that we can observe them because they reflect light, and also they make a considerably annoying <laughs> tonal sound um, so that they do make, you know, sound, they are responsible for sound waves when they clink around and hit the, the jar. So they have some substantial material existence that is fairly well demonstrated, you know, just simply inherently by the dice. And so for the first thing I want to do, I want to put the camera on Matt for just a second. Just, just on Matt. Okay. And now I want to come back to the, to the jars. Okay. Now I've put the jars all together, and what I want to ask to consider is what we want to do now is separate these things into two groups. We want to separate it into a group of existent items with the assumption that the supernatural transcendent dice exist, and non-existent items, which would be the group with the non-existent dice. Okay. And so my question is, how do we do that? 
We guess. I'm going to guess <laughs> that those are the ones that don't exist. Well, how do we know if you're right? Um, you could just take it on faith. <laughs> In other words, we have no criteria with which to determine whether or not Matt chose the right jar, whether or not he pulled the non-existent dice out, or whether he actually pulled the existent transcendent and supernatural dice out. We can't test it because the supernatural dice have the exact same attributes as the non-existent dice. There is no difference between the two. And the problem when we define something as supernatural and transcendent and then we give it all of the same material qualities as nothing in a context of dice, right. we basically eviscerate the term existence and exist because we no longer have any criteria that determines what exists from what does not exist. And so we have to kill the word exist in order to say that supernatural transcendent dice exist. It no longer has meaning because it's no longer discernible from non-existence. So I wanted to just sort of demonstrate that. We've talked about it before on the show, but I wanted to kind of show how it works. Yeah, and oddly enough, if I had grabbed this one <laughs> and said this is the one that doesn't exist, uh, that would have just been stupid. <laughs> right. And this isn't a matter right. of just being able to see it. <laughs> right. um, and as you mentioned, you, you know, there's you weight. It, you it doesn't matter. Whatever can... characteristics right. you you give to right. something that which exists in reality. I mean, right. that's what we're talking about is w within the construct of reality. What is real? Um, and and in part, um, you could make the argument that. Uh, maybe one of these contains more molecules of air than that one. And sure. we, we're unable to discern which one's which right now. Sure. That's, that's, you're correct. And that's a limitation on, on our ability to discern at this moment, at this table. Right. But in a lab, we could. Right. And then you could say that, well, maybe there's just the, and our inability to discern the difference between a transcendent, a transcendent existent object and a non-existent object um, is just a limitation of our ability to discern. Maybe it is. Yeah, fine. It's still, we still need criteria for existence. Yeah. So it, if that is, the, the if point, existence... The point, though, is that if it's beyond our ability to discern, <laughs> right. you can't make any statement right. about which one is. Existence so you can't, oh, is, it exists, you just can't tell it. Existence is whatever is materially manifest, yeah. and what is not is considered non-existent until such time as it demonstrates a material manifestation. It, it is possible that there are supernatural dye in this, in this jar. Yeah. But what I'm saying is if we can't tell them apart from non-dye, yeah, and what, the, what is the difference between nothing and the something that is the same as nothing? Yeah, and I don't. I, well, I'm trying to avoid getting hung up on the the, the visible or the tactile or anything else like right. that. The analogy here, if we if we remove these, right. and we just have these two, and one of them has <laughs> transcendent existent dice, and the other one has nothing. Non, there's no dice, non-existent dice. What's happening when you talk to people who believe in a god or who believe in the supernatural, they're saying, this is the one that has the transcendent dice in it. And I can tell. And I'm sorry that you can't tell, but I know that this is the one. And OK, how do you know? You can get all kinds of different answers. Right. And we're going to These dice have revealed themselves to me. Right. Really? Then well. <laughs> do it again. Well, that's one of the things I have here later, and but we can talk oh, about it. Ahead. That's okay. One of the things, if you switch over to the next page on number five, one of the things I said is, although, if I feel or believe, oh, okay. Do you want to go to that? Yeah. Okay. So keep that burning in your mind for a little while because um, we we have on the line uh, a caller from last week, uh, Matt Slick from uh, Carm.org. You there, Matt? Hey, I'm here. How are you? How are you doing? I'm, I'm Matt. Um, yeah. We spoke by email, and Tracy Harris is with me as Hi. well. Hi, Tracy. Um, I wanted to, to, I don't know, get a couple things out of the way, kind of clearing up for last week. And some of this is directed to you, and some of it's directed to the people that watch the show. I don't know how familiar you are, you are with the show. Um, in addition to the fact that we, we broadcast to Austin on public access television, we also stream the show live over the Internet, and then the shows are uploaded. So some people see things a week later, a year later, 
five years later. The show's been on for 11 years, so some people are behind the curve, and, and I, I don't have any other method of correcting things. Um, some, some of the things that happened last week, um, first of all, there was uh, some confusion about terms. I tried to call in um, and, and did get through, but during the conversation, I, I, I could not uh, get through to talk to you, and I just decided I'd hold it off till this week. Um, and I think as objectively as I can, um, I don't want to apply blame for confusion of terms. I'd just like to say that for some of what you said, I was at least in complete agreement within the context of what you're talking about. And I wanted to see if this week, um, and I have actually the printout, for those, for those people who are interested, the, the website uh, is carm.org, that's C-A-R-M.org. And if you click on, um, I think the easiest way to navigate to this, to this actual transcendent argument for the existence of God is um, there's a link there for uh, secular movements and then one for atheism and then you'll probably find a link for is atheism viable and then there's a link from there. I don't know. Matt, is there a shorter way to get there? Oh, that sounds pretty good. All right. Um, and, I, and first of all, uh, you know, obviously I, I can't speak uh, for the, the gentlemen who were here last week. Um, we've had lots of conversations uh, about this and plenty of email feedback um, with people taking all kinds of different takes on what happened. And I, I'm just going to, for the sake of this, uh, set most of that aside. Uh, I wanted to start by saying that when I went to the site and read the argument, and, and I've read TAG before in different formats or whatever else, uh, I like what you did with it in the sense that you, this is, this is something that, uh, the, the foundations of TAG are something th that I, I would almost say are self-evident, and it confuses me when, when people have a difficulty grasping this. Uh, but the argument itself and, and the, the construct that you're, that you're going through is not something that is necessarily approachable or accessible to everybody. And I think you did a good job of, of making it as approachable as it can be. So, Wow, I want to say thanks for that because I agree exactly with what you're saying. It, it does take a bit of, um, I don't know, uh, mental ability to kind of get through some of the arguments. That's the strength of it, but it's also the weakness of it, I think, that some people can't really grasp some of the principles in there. I don't yeah, think it's, it's probably, but this is a... No, no, I, I, I agree. It's probably one of the reasons why, why this, it may be one of the reasons why this isn't as popular. I will say, though, that, um, I, and I've got the, the printout in front of me, um, if you want to follow along so that we can, you know, get to the meat, because I think there's a, a few spots where I've identified, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, clear problems. Um, and some of these, to be fair, you, you list objections there in, with your responses. Um, some of the objections I'm going to launch um, are similar to or perhaps uh, contextually identical to, to some objections you've received. And in that case, um, I'm not necessarily sure that I buy the response that you gave. Some of these I did not see at the website as well. But okay. starting with number one, um, and part of the way, by the way, part of the confusion from last week, and this is for the, for the, for the viewers and, and for you as well, um, you, when you started talking, um, in, in your written version, you're very clear, you, 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 logical absolutes, logical absolutes, logical absolutes, so that, you, so that the, the person who's reading this knows that you're not talking about just logic, as in the model that we use, the application of these absolutes. You're talking about the absolutes themselves. And we're, right. talk, we're talking about uh, classical logic as well, Aristotelian uh, syllogistic logic, although I'd argue that all the other versions are still dependent upon this. I mean, we're talking, wow. we're talking about something that's absolute um, in that sense. Matt, I'm surprised again. Well said. I, I told you. I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in agreement here. Here's the thing. So, so we're, we're going to go ahead with uh, number one. There's the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the middle. Um, okay, fine. I, I, I got no objection to those. Um, number two, logical absolutes are truth statements, such as that which exists has attributes and a nature. And yeah, I, I would not only agree with that, but I'd say that, that these absolutes only apply to statements that are truth statements. If there's something that is inherent, oh, except in a meta sense, and I'll, I don't want to confuse everybody, but I'll get to that in a second. If there's a statement like, um, this statement is false, which is internally in co contradictory, these absolutes don't say that any statement you could make is necessarily true or false. These absolutes say that any statement you could make have the characteristics of whatever that statement is and not the characteristics of whatever that statement isn't. Did you Let follow me jump in. I'm with you. 
the statement, this statement is false, does not fall into the category of excluded middle, but under the category of uh, non-contradiction because right. it's a self-refuting statement. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you there, too. Okay. So then we get to logical absolutes or transcendent. Uh, actually, I, I, I'm going to, for the purposes of this, I'm, number three is logical absolutes form the, form the basis of rational discourse. That's, that's where I, I was agreeing with you before as well, that um, without these absolutes, uh, you, you really can't make truth statements and, and anything could be contradictory. You have no way of discerning what is or isn't. That's correct. Okay, so number four, logical absolutes are transcendent. This is the one where, where you kind of got an objection, um, although I think that the discussion was referencing two different things. And also, I think that a lot of, um, I, I don't want to say atheists, that's, that's not actually correct. Um, secularists um, have a knee-jerk reaction to the word transcendent, um, and it's justified in, in the sense that how transcendent is used colloquially is something that we would obviously launch an objection to, but that's not the usage you're talking about here. Really, your usage is, it, should, it might be better just to say non-contingent. It's not contingent upon space, time, matter, or thought. Um, yes, uh, as far as logical absolutes, not the contingent upon thought. Uh, the nature of logical absolutes is that there are conceptual. Thought is conceptual. Well, so you're getting ahead of me. You, you, you're getting ahead of me. And, and actually, to be fair, I, I did move ahead, so go ahead. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily agree with the last premise there in that uh, they're not of thought or things like that. But they're not contingent upon physical uh, existence. Yeah. The reason we know that is because of the property material. You probably get into that. I'll let you read through it. Uh, the property function. But go ahead. So, so, so we, we've reached essentially the first part where the, I think there's a problem, and that is in, in number four on number three, uh, four sub three. You say logical absolutes are not dependent on people. That is, they are not the product of human thinking. My response to that is, I agree. They are not the product of human thinking, and we're talking about the absolutes here. Um, I, I would just extend that to say that there's no reason to think they're the product of any thinking. And the only reason I can see that you wouldn't simply put that there is because in a minute you're going to turn around and argue that they are a product of thinking. I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, uh, because, let's see if I can get this out, to say that the product of thinking, um, since they are conceptual by nature, it's like saying they have to exist if someone thinks them. Uh, but then is the thinking the process that res uh, brings you know, the result of a logical absolute? Well, then you fall back on the category of them being formed by someone thinking. That wouldn't work. Well, that's, so, I think that's partly why I'm objecting to, well, we're, we're not quite to number six yet, but we are because we're, we're meshing this together a little bit. Um, Number this we'll, we'll set aside this disagreement on number four for a minute just for, for clarity. Um, five will just grant that they're not dependent on the material world and, and move on to six where you're, where you're saying log logical absolutes are conceptual by nature. And I'd argue that you're using the wrong word there um, just for the sake of clarity. That instead of conceptual, which implies this problem you were just talking about, that, you know, that it is some product of thought, that the correct word to use there is actually abstract. That logical well, absolutes are abstract by nature. Um, we define abstraction, and abstraction requires uh, mental processes. Yeah, yeah, it, it requires mental processes uh, in the sense. Uh, wow, there may not be a good word for this. Um, See, I, let me let me jump in a little bit and help you out because I've honestly I've wrestled with just that right where you're at. Well, there is a flaw. There is a flaw, a logical flaw in six dot one. And that's easily to that's easy to demonstrate. I irrespective, are you saying, are you saying that logic is not a, okay? Because logic is a process of the mind, is what six uh, A says. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you're saying logic is not a process of the mind? No. This is this is the fallacy. This is the fallacy I'm talking about. All, all the way up to this point, you say logical absolutes, logical absolutes, logical absolutes, and then you say logic is a process of the mind. What you're doing in six one is making an inductive argument. You're saying logic is a process of the mind, and that I would agree as long as we're talking about logic in the sense of the models that we do, the, the application of these absolutes. And you're saying logical absolutes provide the framework for logic, which I agree with. 
But then you say, therefore, logical absolutes are conceptual by nature. That is a logical fallacy. To say that the, the application of X is conceptual, therefore X is conceptual, is a logical fallacy. Okay. So then let me ask you, are you saying then that a logical absolute, such as a law of excluded middle, is not a conceptual reality? Um, I'm saying that that may not make sense. That it, it depends on what your definition of conceptual is, that that's what we're having the struggle with. Of the mind. I, the, I would say that that absolute is not contingent on any mind could not be. And when you get to your conclusion, okay. where, where you get to that, that logical absolutes are contingent upon the mind of God, that this is actually self-refuting. Um, no, I would disagree, of course. Okay, can God make A not A? No. Why not? Because it would be a logical contradiction. God which means logic. God, which means God is subject to the laws of logic, these absolutes. He, therefore, he cannot be the author of them. Okay. Um, I hope I, last week when I was talking, each time I would start to give an answer, okay. the hosts would jump in and not let me finish. I actually received numerous emails from atheists who pointed out that very issue. I'm not trying to be whiny and complaining, but, uh, you know, it really does help when asked a question if I can actually complete the thought. I mean, I'm not trying to be complaining here, but... I, I hey, think you know, I've I, been pretty fair today, and I'm stopping go. And I'm stopping so that you can do that. You know, I appreciate that. Now, I like the way that uh, you present your, yourself, because I can tell you're articulate and, art and intelligent, so I like that. But, um, now I forgot where I was, actually, but, uh, you know, God did not author the logical absolutes. They are, what we would say, we're jumping way ahead, but what we would say is they are part of his nature and his essence. God cannot make A be non-A, any more than God can lie or God can stop being God, because God has certain, a certain nature, and he must operate in a manner consistent with his own nature. Right. This is the Christian worldview. I, I, so I, since, I understand that. So since certain things are just impossible, like a square circle, God cannot make a square circle because it's a logically impossible thing. Right. And the problem here is that what you're saying is that these absolutes exist. And th this is the problem with actually the whole argument. Calling this the transcendental argument for the existence of God is, is to me problematic because what it really is is an argument for why are there logical absolutes. So you construct an argument, and by the way, I, I understand you didn't construct this, although this version is yours. I, I, it tags right. been around. A, a, an argument is constructed to say, to explain why the logical absolutes are what they are. And in doing so, there are possibilities and you are excluding the possibility that they simply are what they are, that it is their very nature, th that there could be no other way. And then when you get to your conclusion to say they are um, God, you're either equating God to logical absolutes, which means you're just affirming that logical absolutes exist and are what they are by nature and labeling those absolutes God, or you are claiming that God and logical absolutes are somehow synonymous but not the same. And if that's the case, you've made no argument for the existence of God. You've simply argued for the existence of these absolutes. And to say that it's just a part of God's nature is fundamentally no different from saying that they, those laws, those absolutes are what they are because that's their nature. They couldn't be another way. All right. Well, let's back up then. Let's go through the argument. Okay. See, logic does exist. We use it. It's based upon logical principles. We already went over those, the first, second, third laws of logic. The nature of these logical laws are that they are transcendent. They are not dependent upon space and time for their validity. They are conceptual in the sense that they exist in the mind. You cannot go out to a field and dig in a, a, a bunch of dirt and find the logical absolute called the law of identity. You cannot freeze them, weigh them, measure their length or the color. It doesn't work like that. Can, can, I pa can, can, I, can I pause here for a second? Because I think this is where the first equivocation comes in. It's your show. Oh, I, well, I just, I just want to make, if you were right on the verge of getting to something important, I didn't want to stop you unnecessarily. Um, the, what you're talking about there, uh, this conceptual thing, I still, by the way, I still assert that there's an actual logical fallacy, uh, an inductive argument error uh, in there. But um, when you're saying that they exist in the mind. Um, no, they don't. That's almost metaphorical. If no minds existed, these things would still be true. 
these absolutes uh, go okay. go to the essence of what is, and in, and I guess we could say what what is possible. They they are the essence of everything, and whether or not there's a mind, they still are what they are, and that is, I mean. The, they apply well, to themselves. Up. They apply to reality. They apply to mind. They apply to everything. Actually, and, and you've said they even apply to God. Okay. Well, 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 too many things. Too many things. First of all, you said they are what they are. Uh, that's fine. Saying that the absolutes are God, I did not say that, nor was implying that. You said, or, that God and the logical absolutes are synonymous, not the same. Well, we could ferret that one out. But you said if no mind exists, then they would still be true. Well, that's not a logical statement. Because truth is a mental statement. Truth is All right. a, hold, truth is a statement. Now, if no mind exists, there can be no truth. There can only be reality and actuality. This, this is where this is where you have essentially palmed a card in the argument, because the logical absolutes that you're talking about are operating at a meta level. And then when you say they're conceptual, you're you're applying them. You're actually I'm using saying that they. I'm saying they're conceptual by nature. The statement, that for is, example, the law of identity, something is what it is, is a statement, and it's a truth. Truth exists only when minds exist. Tr truth only exists when minds exist. Statements are so, of the mind. So what you're saying is that, let's, let's just say, and I, I realize that this is, is going to be contradictory. I hope you'll be able to go along with it. Let's just say that there is no mind anywhere. The universe is exactly this, identical, except that there are no minds. Okay? Then there is no truth. But that's not what the logical absolutes are about. They're not about truth. They're about essence. A rock in that universe is still a rock, and it is okay. not not a rock. It doesn't okay, matter on, if there's somebody who can assess the truth, put a valuation on the truth. Those absolutes go to the essence and not the evaluation of it. On the contrary, logic reflects reality. This is why we're able to do mathematics. This is why we're able to make conclusions that work in the real world. The meta-analysis you're trying to get to is an attempt to distinguish the ontological nature of them from the truth statements of what they are, separate them, which I think is a category mistake on your part, and then say there is no real reality relationship. And obviously that cannot be the case because we exist in reality. We use them all the time. You're the one. Logic, you, 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 uh, logical absolutes are statements. And they do relate to truth because it is true that a statement cannot be both true and false at the same time because the nature of the second law of logic states a statement cannot be both true and false at the same time. The very nature of the statement of law of logic there deals with the nature of truth and which contradicts what you said earlier. No, no, it doesn't. Here, here's the yes, thing. it does. Hey, well, okay, then I guess you're right if, if your only response to, is to interrupt and say, yes, it does. Is, is that how that works? Well, it's not my only response. I uh, gave you a good one. I, 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 well, you didn't let me fit, get to, to respond to this. You're talking about two different things. The statement, X equals S. Yes, that statement does not exist if there are no minds to make that statement. Uh, its truth value is, is meaningless and pointless if there aren't any minds to assess it. And yet, that's not what these absolutes are. These absolutes are not the statement within the mind, the statements point to the absolutes. A rock in a universe with no minds is still whatever it is, and it is not whatever it is not. That's the absolute. I the statement is not the absolute. And when you say that these logical absolutes are, not, are transcendent, that they are not dependent upon matter, that they are not dependent on anything in the universe, and then turn around and say that they are conceptual and that they are our reflections of reality, you are contradicting yourself. Actually, sorry, I mean, Matt, I love this conversation, but you're the one offering a self-contradictory statement. When you say the only thing that exists is a rock, and a rock is a rock, what you're offering is the self-contradictory statement. The only thing that exists is a rock, and then what you do is violate that and offer a truth statement. Which no, I never, I yes, never said, I never, would you, I never said the only thing that exists is a rock. I said in a universe that is identical to this, but in which there are no minds, a rock is still what it is. I did not there, say the only thing that exists okay. is a rock. If there are, if there are no minds, and a rock is in existence, and you make the statement that it is true as it is, you are 
making a true statement. I am making a true statement. I am making I am making a true statement in this universe where minds exist. In the other in the other universe where no minds exist, no truth statement could be made, but the rock is still a rock and it's still not not a rock. Then what you're doing is affirming that the law of identity is still true, whether or not you're there to know it or not. Exactly. Not That's what we mean by absolute <laughs> and non-contingent. So then you have a non-contingent, conceptual absolute, not dependent upon a mind. Not, con not conceptual. That's the that's the point. How that's can a point. statement not be conceptual? The statement is occurring in this universe. There would be no statement in the other universe, but the essence would be the same. Now how can the statement exist without a mind? It cannot. Because, because the logical absolutes are essential and not conceptual. Okay. What you're doing is saying that the nature of logic itself is concomitant with the existence of physical properties. No, because in, yes. in, no, because they apply even if there is nothing. Nothing. The it, application is of the mind. The ap I agree. The application of this is of the mind. The application so of using, these. Uh, why do you keep using conceptual applications to verify a non-conceptual? Situation. Because you have to talk about it. We're, the, the exactly. Point. <laughs> you cannot do it without but, but mind. That goes, that Truth goes. doesn't exist without a mind. The logical absolutes by necessity require a mind. This is, this is the contradiction in your thing. You're saying that X, <laughs> X is conceptual, therefore the thing that X is based upon is conceptual. No, That's a fallacy. That. That's no, a fallacy. No, 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 no. That's like saying um, my lust <laughs> is emotional, therefore the object of my lust is also emotional. It's, no, a, no. it's a category fallacy. No, no, that's called a fallacy of division. Look, um, the nature of the logical logic, logic is, is a process of proper inference. The now, proper inference occurs in the mind. Logic is a process of the mind. Agreed. The logical basis of logic itself is on basic, I mean, the basic conceptual laws. They are statements that we codify. All you do is when you say, hey, look, we are the ones codifying what already exists, you're not saying anything other than they are either the property of the universe, which can't be, or we are inventing them by codifying them. And you're saying then that what they really are are dependent upon human minds for their existence. No, no, what I'm saying, I, I agreed with almost everything I had up to the end, except that what you've done is you've talked about two different things. You've talked about logic, and that is the process that we go through, the thinking, the model that we build in our mind that reflects reality, that is necessarily conceptual. But these logical absolutes that we talked about, they're not logic, and in, in they are the foundations upon which logic is built. They are what true, are they are, hang on, they are true, and they are true, and you, and you went to universe, and you went to reality, they are true irregardless, irrespective, I can't believe I almost said irregardless, that was a good one, you got me so flustered, you're using <laughs> me not, let me use non-words. <laughs> They are true irrespective of the subject. They are essentially true. It, the, reality is reality, and it's not not reality. It applies to every reality. It applies to anything you could think of, including things that don't exist. Now, the application of this is conceptual. That I grant. But the concept is pointing to something physical. It's like saying, I have a concept of an apple, and it's not the same as the apple, and the apple is not a concept. But there's a, there is a physical apple that I'm pointing to. That's, that's not a perfect analogy because we're pointing to something physical. Our logical thought processes, the application of these absolutes, and, and in some cases, you know, we use other things because, you know, like Madal logic deals with possibility inferences towards necessity. But that's our attempt to understand the universe in which we live. And there is a presumption that it operates under certain rules uh, and, and, and that there is uh, consistency throughout this. Those are all things that we do is perhaps in the scientific investigation. But, yeah, at the called begging the question. At, but, at the, but at the core, these three absolutes of classical lo logic that were sorted out at, at the time of Aristotle, they address, for example, in a syllogism, they address the validity of the structure. They are content agnostic. A equals A, A does not equal not A, and it's neither, not neither or both at the same time. This is, this addresses essence. It is the only sense that this is conceptual is that you have a concept of this. 
but the this in that sentence is not in itself conceptual. Otherwise, you have the situation where A equals A or A does not equal not A is based on somebody's thought. It becomes contingent upon thought, which is, exactly, which is exactly what you want to do. You want to get to the point where you can say that since we're not perfect, it must be contingent on a perfect mind since they're absolutes. Well, guess what? If, well, first of all, you can't get there because that's not it. You've changed the scope of what we're talking about. We're talking about the absolutes. But also when you get to the point where you say that I'm going to label it God, well, congratulations, you've labeled this non-contingent absolute that we both almost, I thought, agreed exist. You've just labeled it God. Well, you said a lot. There's a lot to comment on here. Nope. Um, but let me ask you this. Okay. Tell me what the essence, the very nature, the ontos of these logical absolute laws. What are they by nature? I don't know, but I do know that they are what they are, and they are not what they are not. So you don't know what they are. That's correct. But you're telling me what they're not. No. I'm saying that they are. are, they are I'm saying that they are what they are, and they are not what they are not. Yeah, well, that's called begging the question. You're saying it is what it is because it is what it is. That's just citing the law of, not, of, of identity. Right. If you don't know what they are, how can you tell me that they're not? I, I, I can tell you what they are not, and, here, and here's why. Because, not. Because, because R is one thing, and R not is everything that isn't that one thing. And so if I had to identify anything in this pool, that doesn't mean that I've eliminated this entire pool. Can you tell me what the logical absolutes are not? Um, I, I'm not talking about um, them in the physical sense of an essence. So they're not physical? I, I have no idea. Well, all right. You, if you're going to tell you me are asserting, that I'm wrong, you, you need to be able to identify what they are if you can properly tell me what it's not. No, See, no, 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 no. I do not. No, I do not, not need. Okay, then you need to be able to identify what God is before you can tell me that he is. Okay. And, and you got you got to prove this. You can't just assert it. No, you said, so I, how do I prove? This is the proof. I'm saying we're, we're talking in one context, and, and I'm afraid I, 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 there's a limit to how long I can let this go on before we start losing, call, losing callers and viewers. Um, and, and maybe we can take it offline, discuss it in email, and get back to it again on another call. But what I'm saying is you're saying that, they are, that, they, that these laws are transcendent, not contingent, um, although you you leave one mind as an exclusion to that, um, and absolute. And I'm saying, and then you go on to say that they're conceptual in nature because we think about them. And I'm saying no. that that argument is logically flawed. I'm not saying they're conceptual in nature because we think about that's them. That's exactly what you said. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I'm saying that we are able to think about them, and because we can recognize them doesn't mean that they are of our minds. It means that we recognize them. It's the same as I recognize right. them in my backyard. So, or what so, is it? so what it's are you recognizing? So what are you recognizing? Because if you say, I can recognize I'll an answer. apple. Hang on. Because if you say, I can recognize an apple, and therefore the apple is conceptual, that is exactly what you're saying in this point, And that's the fallacy I'm pointing out. OK. You're citing the law of identity. Look, I'm a theologian. And if someone were to come to me and say the Trinity is one God in three modes or forms, I'd say, no, that is not right. The reason it's not right is because it violates what the true definition of it really is. This is what it really is. I'm able to, et uh, to recognize what is wrong because I know what it really and truthfully is. How do now, you know? How do you know? Because I know from the scriptures what it is. That's a whole other topic. If you want me to come back on and discuss the Trinity, I will. But here's the thing. The principle is this. And if you want to tell me that I'm wrong about de deciding what they are, defining what they are, and you can't even tell me what they really are, then you have no logical business of telling me that I'm wrong. That, that sir, is a complete fallacy. I identified a logical fallacy in your argument. My inability, Actually, to tell you, my inability to tell you exactly what they are does not mean that I can't identify one of the things they're not. But that is all irrelevant to the point that you have built this on a logical fallacy. You have said that logic, our thought process, is conceptual, and therefore the absolutes upon which it is founded are also conceptual. And that is fundamentally the same as saying, I have a concept of an apple, and therefore the apple is, is also conceptual. That is flawed. The argument is flawed. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying I, that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you don't see it that way, but the structure is the same. 
Well, I can say the same thing about you, Matt, respectfully. I'm sorry you don't see it that way. But the fact is, you don't have a standard by which you can judge whether these logical absolutes are or are not conceptual. I'm asking you for a list. Tell me what they are not. I will write them down here you're, on my computer as we're talking. You're you asking me. Not. You're asking me to prove that a god doesn't exist, essentially. No, I'm not. And I don't. Yes, you are, essentially. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Let me no, finish. No, I'm not. I'm asking you to tell me. I'm going to hang up on you in a second, Matt. If you don't let me finish this, I'm making an analogy here. I'm sorry that your brain missed it. You are essentially asking me to prove that a god doesn't exist and claiming that a god does exist in your mind until I actually demonstrate that he doesn't. That's why you're doing the same thing nope. with these with these logical absolutes because you're saying, nope. and you just said a second ago, that if I can't tell you what they aren't, I can't tell you what they are. No, I do not believe in putting an atheist on the spot and saying prove God does not exist. It's proving then stop negative. doing it. I don't do that, and that's not what I'm doing. I tell Christians to stop doing it. You, 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 you just did it with regard, not God, with regard no. to the logical absolutes. No, no, you said because these things are not conceptual by nature. Okay, great. Then what are they? And you couldn't get, tell me what they really are. They are non-conceptual. There are, so two, there are okay. two possibilities. They are conceptual or non-conceptual, and I'm saying they're non-conceptual. Okay, great. Now we're making progress. I said if that an hour ago. If they're non-conceptual, then I'm going to assume that what you're meaning is they're physical. No. Non-conceptual does not mean physical. It means non-conceptual. It means that it's not conceptual. Whether or not it's physical or not is not the issue. You're making a, a fallacy. <laughs> you're making a fallacy of exclusion. You're saying there's either physical or conceptual, and that's all there is. You That'd don't, be a false dichotomy, not exclusion. You, you uh, are excluding so, other options. It, uh, false dichotomy at, is a fallacy of exclusion. I want you to tell me what they actually are. I or, told you, they're, they're non-conceptual. What does that mean? It means they're not concepts. Okay, so logical absolutes are not concepts. That's correct. Okay, they're not concepts. Are they not anything else? I have no idea. Okay. What, 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 is anything, what does concepts. anything else mean? So that you know for a fact that these things are not concepts. Um, do you know for so a fact they're absolutes? The statements are non-concepts. So A is equal to A. That's All a non-concept. Um, a is equal to A. It's a non-concept. It is Both not a concept, concept but we can, oh, we can conceive Ooh. of that. The statement is not the essence. But it's not a concept, but we can conceive of it. The you know of any place where A equals A exists outside of the mind? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist? That's then correct. we're talking about it? No, no. Now you've, now you've really changed scopes because existence, I'm sorry if we're using a different word here, um, goes back to what, what is in reality. These things in my thought of reality? These things transcend reality. Reality is subject to them. Do, do your thoughts exist? My thoughts exist, yes. Okay, then we have concepts that really exist. Yes, we do. So, the statement... But I said that a they're not concepts. A is a conceptual statement. It yes. exists. Yes, the, con the conceptual okay. statement, A equals A, exists. So then it exists in your mind? The conceptual statement, A equals A, exists. The, okay. actual, so the, actual, the actual thing that that statement points to is not a concept. Ah, it is a truth statement, which this is conceptual by nature, which probably reflects reality. You cannot give me the necessary preconditions for intelligibility. The only thing you can do is presuppose the validity of logic without it given the necessary conditions for its existence. The very argument of TAG is this. They are conceptual by nature because they are of the mind. They only occur in mind. You don't find them under rocks. You can't freeze them. You can't take a picture of them. They, they are mutable. The if you say that they are not of the mind, then you have to tell them, what are they? Uh, whatever your argument is, is, I don't care, Matt. Whatever you say, that's what it's not going to be. That's not helping the argument at all. I would want an atheist. I'm not trying to help your argument. I'm trying to show you where you went wrong. <laughs> but with all respect, Matt, you're not. I mean, we both will not agree on this. I, okay, I identified a fallacy in there, and it's a fallacy of structure. I've it's, corrected it, many of the times you've cited a fallacy of being wrong, saying, no, that's not it. It's actually this one. No, you have, you have said it's not a fallacy, but you haven't actually uh, corrected it. You've just said that it's not a fallacy. When we're what, we're, what, we're talking, what we're talking about here is, and, and you keep changing scope, Woo. There, is, there is in my mind 
a concept, a concept statement A equals A. That concept statement is a concept in my mind. It points to something, just as a concept of an apple points to something. In the apple case, it points to something physical. In the concept A equals A, it points to something abstract. Yeah. Did you invent the concept? No. It's not the third upon you. Uh, it's no, it's not the, the the concept. The concept itself, that concept statement, it is uh, not dependent upon me, but it That's is. Right. It, it, the concept statement itself is contingent upon my existence and my ability to conceive it. Because if I'm ah. not here, because if I'm not here, then my concept disappears. Ah, so different minds can take these things up and bring them in or out of existence according yes. to their creative ability. No, they don't bring them in and out of existence. They bring the concepts in and out of existence. Whatever concept okay. you, whatever concepts you have in your mind, you have <coughs> brought them into existence in your mind, All not right. in reality, not not as a physical thing. In okay. your mind. Let me run with that. Let me run with that a little bit. You're an atheist who denies the existence of God. Period. Right? Um, wow. Where'd you get that from? I, I'm going somewhere. But, but am I right? Um, let me, okay, let me ask you this. I'll just you say, I'll say you are, because at least for every um, practical definition of God that I've ever heard that's not, you know, God is love or happiness or, or something where, where God is being a label stuck onto something else or God is the logical absolutes, yes, I don't believe in any of those other gods. I don't believe okay. in those supernatural, transcendent thinking minds. Okay, so you are a materialistic naturalist then? Essentially. Okay. That would mean then that, to burning this down really quickly, your mind, your brain, is the product of physical properties in the universe and biochemical reactions. I, I, yeah. Okay. And they are limited to and governed by the physical properties of uh, physical properties. Sure. Okay? Yeah. That means that there is no such thing as logic. No. Logic is. Let me finish. Logic is the process of proper inference. If biochemical reactions are all that you are thinking, then all that you can say is that what you perceive to be logically true and absolute and necessary is nothing more than the result of chemical reactions in your brain. Agreed. Here's not, here's the problem. That would not Here, be logic. Here's the your problem. Your system is self-refuting. Here's, here's the problem. You just said uh, what you perceive, that, that perception is what exists. That concept in the mind. Yes. And only in the mind. You're talking about empiricism and epistemology here. Yes, that concept but exists in my mind. In, in naturalism, logic doesn't have a place of its own transcendent existence in any way. There's nothing more than the That's correct, of because reactions. it's an abstract. Then there it, is no it such is thing the as essence logic of in what it is the essence of what it is. How, no, I, here's, what, here's what confuses me the most. How can guys like you not get this and refute it constantly and then turn around and make these exact same points about a god where you're taking the same characteristics and then extending it to also be a thinking, caring, loving mind? Well, I'm going to answer that by asking you, how can a person as intelligent as you and as articulate as you not get it that the transcendent nature of rationality itself is dependent upon conceptual realities and absolute mind that authors them. Otherwise, you have no rationality to begin with. Because they're not. I can, can't, but because your answer, what you say, is not true. We both agree that logic exists independent of what you and I are. And even though no, we just, no, we don't. No, we don't. And that's the problem. We don't, we don't both agree, agree that. We, no, no, no. Just let me finish. We don't both agree that logic exists independent of us. We both agree that the absolutes upon which logic are based uh, exist independent of us. Logic is purely conceptual and contingent upon a mind to use. Go, to let's go with that then. So then the conceptual absolute, I mean, excuse me, these logical absolutes, do they depend upon our existence no. or their existence? They don't, they don't depend on anything. They're not existing? They, in, in what sense? In the sense that they're a part of reality? No, reality depends upon them. They are true. But you said they're non-physical. So what other options are there? I don't know. You Abstract. don't know? Abstract. So wait, 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 wait. You're telling me about what they are and aren't, and arguing against them, but you don't even know what they are. Well, this is, this, is, this is actually one of the things that I find most laughable about apologists, and I won't even ask for you, for you to not take this personally. Um, once, <laughs> it, once again, 
you get to this point where I don't know is such a bafflingly unacceptable answer to you. This is the colossal arrogance of the theist position, that they're unable to say, I don't know, maybe we'll find out someday. And instead of accepting an I don't know, they just go ahead and leap to the first thing that seems most reasonable to them. If I were in a debate, in a formal debate with you out there in Austin, Texas, and we're debating this issue, and you said, after I asked you, tell me what the nature and the essence of these things are. And you said, I just don't know. I'm going to come back again and say, in a formal debate where we're supposed to be using logic, you're telling me what logic is not, but you can't even tell me what it is in any way, shape, or form. I, no, 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 that's not, that's not in any way, shape, or form. We're talking about within the context of what you're talking about. I already told you they're non-conceptual. Now, you want, me to, you want me to start going through all the other possibilities and eliminate those as well, and I yes. can't do that, and neither can anybody else. I'd like that. Well, I can do it for I, you. I'd like they're you to prove that God physical. exists without a fallacy. They're, they're I They're like obviously not physical because we can't weigh them, see them, touch them, measure them. You're, you're asserting that something is either physical or conceptual, and that there are no other options. Let's go with another possibility. Do you have another, third option? Seriously, I don't know. I mean, you know, what else? In existence, some of these are physical, or I know that thoughts exist. My thoughts exist. I can't freeze them or weigh them. But that's so existence. I know that's a conceptual that, reality, and there's a physical reality. What other reality have you got to offer? Okay, what, what, how does God exist? Because that's existence within reality, and we're talking about something that we've already defined as transcending reality. Okay, can you answer the question, though? Can you have a third option, either conceptual existence or physical existence? Is there a third option that you're aware of? I'm not aware of any other. Please correct me. Maybe I just don't know. I haven't read enough. Um, what I'm asking is about what you mean when you say exists, because when we talk about exists... That which is. We're talking about, essentially, um, within the bounds of, of, of reality, and that includes concepts. There you go. Concepts and physical um, but, nature. But that existence is subject to those absolutes, which is why we agreed in the first place that they are transcendent, that they are not contingent upon any matter, any space, or any time. The flaw here, one, one of the, well, the other flaws that I didn't quite get to address is in the bigger scope of the, of the argument, which is you're asking why are the laws of absolute what they are? And why is a question regarding causality? And causality is necessarily temporal, and we have already excluded something because we're talking about something that transcends time. You're asking something that is essentially nonsense. No. Okay, well, if that's we, the best answer we, I've ever heard. If we only have two possibilities to account for something, I'm not saying there's only if, two in this if. situation. I'm saying if there is. I agree. If we only, if we only have two and one of them is negated, then the other one is validated automatically. And, and prove to me that there are only two possibilities, because the only thing you've done so far is say, I only can think of two, can you think of others? You haven't proved that there are only two. I don't know of any other, and I'm, I'm with you, you're, you're being correct here. They haven't proven right. that there's, you haven't proven that there's any other, but this, this is it. There is either the physical and non-physical, either conceptual or non-conceptual, you also are required to offer me a third option. If I say these are the two options, I'm not required to prove the exclusion of all others because it'd be like you saying, don't ask me to prove God does not exist. I'm asking you to demonstrate what does exist, a third option. Uh, if you don't have a third option, then you cannot say that the uh, logical absolutes are not conceptual. You could say they are, but you cannot logically hold to that position if you cannot give me rationally a third option. Is a no, I don't need a third option people. because I went with the second option. The option was they were either conceptual or not conceptual, and I'm going with not conceptual because conceptual then makes them physical. Because con no, no, because what, what's the third option? Conceptual makes them contingent upon thought. That's the what's, problem. What's the third option? You're you're asking for what's the third option between two things that aren't two options of this uh, uh, where there's a third or a fourth. Um, it's like I'm saying I'm, I'm the saying third. they're either red or blue and you're, you're saying uh, or and you're saying okay it's not red and it's not apple so what is it? That's what no, you're doing. Category mistake. Category mistake. I'm not doing that. If there are only two possibilities, give me a third possibility. In all seriousness, I'm not angry. I'm not. I'm, I'm curious. Is there a third possibility? Conceptual reality I or physical reality? I don't accept your premise that the two possibilities that 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 the 
I, what I said was something is either conceptual or not conceptual. And you said that non-conceptual equates to physical. And I'm saying that this is one of those things, maybe the only thing, whatever, oh. um, that is not conceptual, that is also then what is not it? physical. It is you can't offer me a third option. Logic requires the third option. The third three option three is neither. neither. Neither? It is neither conceptual nor physical. So you jump into nothingness to defend your position? No. I'm yes. saying they neither. are what they are. This is an essential and now what and now nonsense? and now and now Matt, after forty five minutes or so, um, I can't count the number of times I've repeated this. Um, so we're gonna stop because there are other callers, there are callers that are on hold, um, and I'll be more than happy to talk about this more in email, or you can call in another time. For those that are interested, you can go to karm.org. The website's actually listed up on the corner okay. of your screen. Well, um, call me up. Call my show. Okay. I have a radio show five days a week in the Boise area, streamed over the Internet. We can talk about this. And if you come up with a third option, let me know. I'd love I, to hear it. What I, it? I, I'm just, I just, I'm not necessarily sure where, what the purpose of that would be because, mm. because, oh, yeah. because I identified a fallacy of structure in 6.1, and your <clears throat> only response is, no, it's not. No, that's not and, 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 response. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not your only response. Your second response was, you need to give me another option. Uh, no, no, I don't. The nature, the nature of the. No, I'm sorry. I'm putting your ass on hold now because I want to get this out and I want to move on. Uh, thanks for the call, Matt, and and I, we can talk about it another time. The nature of a syllogism is that you can know that it is unsound without necessarily knowing which premise is flawed or whether the structure is valid. And go look up reductio ad absurdum if you need to. I don't need to know what all the other options are to know that this option is not correct. To know that is flawed, to know that there's an, a, an invalid structure in here. There's about 18 different spots where this particular argument was wrong, and, 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 and I'll admit, uh, I'm sure there are people out there who are face palming and pounding their head against the wall, and I'm sure there are people who are screaming, no, 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 Matt, you're wrong, and no, 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 Matt, you're wrong. Um, if you actually go to the site and read through the argument, and, and, and Russell and I looked this over during the week, um, this week, there are clear spots where the scope of what you're talking about changes. And uh, it's, I can't, I don't know another way to express this other than to say when we're talking about A, and then you talk about A1 and say that it's A, I can't well, get there. I have a, co I guess anyway, a question. Anyway, yeah, you haven't talked at well, all. Well, no, so, I have yeah. a question about what you were just talking about. It seems to me that concept, concept, mm -hmm in my mind is based on experiential reality. Like my concepts can only come from my experiential, my experiences with reality. Generally, I mean, there might be exceptions. I'm not averse to having exceptions, but in general, I conceive of things based on, you know, what I know, what I've learned, how I interact with reality. And unless something's wrong with my brain, I conceive of things based on what I am. Like this is soft, you know, this is, Whatever I, the apple is red. I mean, I conceive based on what I perceive, and also how I think about it in a lot of ways. The way I was raised, or you know, so you make observations about things around you. Yeah. Now I understand that the absolutes transcend my reality, my universe, or whatever. But at the same time, my experience with reality thus far is that it is an attribute of all things that they are what they are and they're not what they're not. And if they're not anything, like the empty jar, like the non-existent die, are non-existent die and they're not not non-existent die. Yeah, the, the thing so you're, the what, what I'm is saying is that that's a bit of induction. That that's because I've seen this so many times, it seems to be like a right, good rule of thumb right. thing. Now, the thing about these laws being absolutes is that the laws themselves can be subject, like A equals A. Right. You can take A equals A equals A equals A. Right. And I realize it's probably confusing somebody. What, what they mean is they apply to themselves. Right. They are what they are. They are tautologies. Right. They are right. necessarily themselves. So to me, even though I can conceive of the concept A equals A, mm -hmm. for myself as just the small human that I am, it is just simply based on everything I've ever seen that adheres to this. 
Yeah. And then the idea of saying it's transcendent would be, you know, I can't really think of any kind of universe or situation or time or anything that would uh, impact where this wouldn't be true or where this wouldn't be correct or where this wouldn't be the case or where this wouldn't be the nature of whatever is or isn't there. And so it seems to me that, that it is a concept that's based on an observation of simply saying everything I know works this way and you know what, I can't even think of how it wouldn't work this way. So yeah. it is an operator that exists in the physical reality, but it also would exist even if there wasn't a physical reality because it's just that kind of an operator that applies to absolutely anything whether it is or isn't. Yeah, yeah it's... It might be fair to say that it, that 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 this law. Um, it's an observation on reality, or or on any reality. Yeah, but the, the problem with saying that though is that now you've tied it to an observation, that you've tied it to. No, the observation is my conceptualization of what I'm yes. experiencing, and but the, it's there. Well, I mean, it's it's this. this. This goes beyond what you're actually experiencing. But okay. anyway. Um, well, yeah, it does. But I'm just saying that the reason I would conceive of it is because everything I experience adheres to that. But everything but that I... that's an induction, and, and that's not what this is. The well, concept, though, is... The concept is our... Right. Yes. Yeah. But what I'm saying is the concept is based on what I... I mean, I get the concept from what I observe. But then what I can realize beyond that, what can I extrapolate beyond that, is that even things I couldn't observe, anything right. I could possibly yeah. make up, this would apply to. Yeah. And so and it applies to itself. I think that in our minds, the concept does derive from reality, from physical reality. But that doesn't mean that it wouldn't apply to any kind of abstraction. It could. He, he's talking, he, his question, though, was about the, the actual thing that we're talking about. It's not a thing. It's an observation. Well, yes on something that is a quality of every single thing that is or isn't. It, but it's, yes, it is a, a quality. Yeah. I mean... I don't know. We, we got callers waiting, and I'm okay. pretty sure that <laughs> right. there's going to be mail that I just don't right. even want to look at this week. But and, and we'll see. Maybe Matt will be back on the show at some point to talk about something else. Maybe he won't. Maybe that was more than enough for any of us. But we've got Amy in Panama. How you doing? Thanks for waiting. Hi, how are you? I'm good, and you get to talk to Tracy. Oh. Hi. Well, um, What's it for uh, you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. You had a question for me. Go ahead. I'm just well, kidding. Well, it, it applies to both. It could apply to both of you. I just, um, I, I saw your show. I've seen your show um, on YouTube, basically. It's all I've been watching this weekend. Um, I actually live in Florida, so I can't see who, who else is there with you. I'm sorry. It's me and Tracy. Okay, Tracy. Yeah, hey. Um, hi. <laughs> Um, Matt, you said that you have 25 or so years of experience in the church, and um, I was wondering if any of that was, uh, how much of that was in childhood, like young childhood? Well, I'm, I'm going to be 40 in February. Oh, okay. Um, so it was. And, and, and to clarify, uh, this is just an, uh, a minor little point about phrasing. Uh, I was a believer for 25 years or so, roughly from the round, around the age of five till a little after the age of 30. Um, I w it wouldn't be fair to say I had 25 years experience in the church because there was a period of time where I wasn't going to church at all. I was still a, a believer, but I wasn't going to church. But it was something you were raised with, is what I'm asking. Yeah, it's, yeah I, I walked down the aisle at a revival when I was about five years old. Okay, great. Then you can really relate. Um, I, I'm, I'm in my mid-20s, and I, over the past few years, I've become more comfortable in my non-belief. Um, but I was raised... Christian, and uh, my mother is Christian, and I'm, I, you know, I haven't really come out to them because her suffering that she would feel for quote the loss of my soul, yep, um, would be real suffering. Yeah, and I'm not comfortable with that. Um, but mostly, my question is uh, this fear. Uh, when I, you know, when you get a little tipsy, you're getting an altered state. You, you ponder different things, you know. And there's always in the back of my mind, there's fear. And it's, and I know it's, that's how they work you. That's how they get you as a child. Yeah. How long um, have you been away from it? And it's, I, feel, I feel robbed, basically. I feel <laughs> like if I hadn't been raised in the church, I'd be able to think of things on such a deeper, more complex level. And I, I just wonder if this fear of the, like, I feel like I've betrayed my, my parents and, community and things like that because I don't believe it anymore. 
And I just wonder, how long does this take to go away? <laughs> <laughs> how long have you been out? I haven't been out to, to my parents, um, but I've been comfortable with my non-belief for about one or two years. But I've always had this nagging fear. Fear, fear of what? Just anything. Um, you know, you'll think about, oh, well, maybe hell exists or this or that. Right. But it's, okay. it's ridiculous. Yeah, that goes away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it just takes some time. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I can't. I can't tell you how long it's going to take to go away. Because, and and maybe for somebody it doesn't go away. Uh, and I agree. It's it's one of those insidious little leftovers uh, of religion. And um, it's kind of like I guess the best example that I, that I ever came up with was when somebody asked, you know, don't you don't you miss, you know? I mean, once upon a time I believed that when I died I was going to go to heaven, and they're like, don't you? Do that? <laughs> and you know that that feeling. Well. I suppose perhaps I missed the feeling, but in recognizing that that feeling was caused by something that's not true, not only have I not lost something, it's not like I lost the opportunity to go to heaven, I realized that I never had the opportunity to begin with. That realization is more knowledge which betters my life and betters my perception of reality. Everything that could have been a negative about this the discovery that it is a negative is a positive and it outweighs everything that was negative. I just want to add, I, somebody wrote in and I just compared it to um, like a stray cat that I adopted. And <laughs> all my cats like that I've had that have been taken care of since they were kittens, they'll lay on the floor and when I walk by they don't move and I have to step over them. But this cat that I picked up as a stray, if you even walk near him, he gets up and runs away like you're going to step on him or kick him. And it breaks my heart to see that because I know that he's afraid of me even though I would never hurt him. But whatever his past is, he's obviously afraid of being kicked or stepped on and he moves out of the way if he sees you walking near him. So I hope one day that'll go away because I hate to see some but something cringing out of fear just because it was taught that earlier. I hope one day he can realize there's nothing to fear from me. And that's the thing. It's like sometimes it just takes time to learn that, you know what, I, I don't have to be living in fear of these things. And it's, it, when it's ingrained in you, it takes a little while to go away. It is. And I'm also envious because I try to live an ethical lifestyle. Um, if I wrong somebody, that guilt stays with me so, so long. Um, yeah. And all these people that I know, I mean, my mother's a good person, but most of the people that I experience, I live in the Deep South and all that, they, um, they identify as Christians, and they're some of the nastiest people. And it just makes me so envious that at the end of the week, they can just go in and pray, and they don't have to feel bad about themselves. Yeah. It irritates me so much because I do something, and I have guilt, and they can just feel like, you know, Jesus forgave them. Yeah. And it's just... It's uh, and and <laughs> while, while I, I understand it and I, I, your feeling and, and I agree, I'm no longer envious of them. Uh, to me, it's like uh, envying somebody who shoots up heroin to forget the pain they're going through. I don't envy them. I, I think that's kind of pitiful. The guilt, the guilt that you feel is a good thing. It's like feeling pain is a good thing. It's what tells you to take your hand off the stove. The guilt that you feel when you wrong somebody is a good thing. It's what keeps you from doing it again. And these people who can go in and have it all absolved without any effort or work, who get to go on and feel good right away, they're the ones who are going to go out and do it again. Yeah, I mean, people around here are very, very openly religious. I mean, we had a prayer at our work get together, and it was just, it was so uncomfortable. And it's just, yeah. I just, you know, I know how their character is, and it's just, there's a anyway, reason. With, there's with a the, reason why. Uh, there's a reason why so many Catholics walk into confession week after week, confessing the same crap. The same thing. And uh, I'm sorry to take up your time, but um, what did you? What do you think about um, your parents? Did they have a? Did they have a hard time if you told them? Like, I know my mother would be devastated, and she would possibly, for the rest of her life, be very, very sad. And yeah. I, I just feel like that's inflicting unnecessary pain on someone. Yeah, I had this exact same discussion with myself over and over again for about a year. Um, it was, I want to be honest about who I am, especially to the people that I love. I don't want to hide who I am. I don't want to be the guy who nods and smiles or keeps his mouth shut when people say something that's necessarily absurd or that I now consider to be absurd. I want to be open and honest about who I am with everybody that, that I care about. 
and yet I know that doing that is going to cause them pain. And it's pain that's probably not going to go away because um, it's not like I'm going to convince my parents or the guy who was just on the phone that God doesn't exist. Um, um, so is it, is it worth hurting them in order to make me feel better? And for a year or so, I said, no, it's not. I said it's one of those situations where it's better. Um, I, I, I kind of conned myself into you're not actually lying, you're just not telling the truth. And, right. I, and I convinced myself that that was better than actually doing the harm. And one of the biggest reasons that I ended up coming out as I did was because I was forced out by an uncle of mine um, who found out online. And so, yes, it did hurt my parents. And the relationship was very strained with some really um, odd and hurtful things said early on. Um, that's been a couple of years ago. Um, now, there, things are... Not, things are never going to be normal or back to the way they were. But things are close to normal. And there were some agreements made that, you know, were just, you know, they had to come to grips in their mind that, yeah, this is still our son and we still love him. And, okay, we're, we're convinced that he's working for Satan and trying to convince other people to join him in hell. But we want to love him anyway. Um, so that, that, that's what's going on in their head. And, and mine is... Um, Telling me how much you believe in Jesus is not going to make me believe in Jesus. Um, if right. you believe there's a God and that he answers prayer and that he'll reveal himself to anybody who asks, then the best thing that you could do instead of preaching or stressing or worrying is to pray that he'll reveal himself to me because I'm not going to deny it if he does. I might not worship him, but I'll at least believe in him. Um, well, the the, the concept of intercessory prayer to me is just insane anyway, because if God has his mind yeah. made up and his will is perfect, then who the hell are you to, to ask him to change it? Yeah. If you believe in it. So I don't understand. You know, I used to pray too, but I don't, I, you know, now that I've stepped back, I think, it, that why would I pray? If I believe God, everything's for the greater good, then I have no right to ask that something, you know, to be changed. Yeah, so unless, unless the sense. greater good includes you asking. But anyway, we don't want to go down the track. Anyway, um... <laughs> I, I can't say you'll know when the time is right, because that might not be true. Um, I, I, I can't tell you anything other than what happened with me and, and tell you that the best thing you can do is partly what you're already doing, um, be yourself. But um, there are so many people who leave religion and end up feeling alone, because everybody around them is religious. And one of the reasons that the ACA exists and why we have so many events and things like that is so it's not just so we can sit around and bash Christians, although I'm sure we'll do some of that tonight, but uh, it's, it's so that people who would ordinarily feel alone because they're not part of this extremely large majority and they're also looked down upon and have their rights infringed upon by this majority. Th so those people have somebody like-minded to share time with. And right. so finding not just an atheist group, but uh, a secular, free thought, ethical, humanist, whatever group in your area, any, any group you find that keeps you active with like-minded people where you're not ostracized for something you believe uh, is beneficial. Yeah, I'm not sure how many of those there are around here, but uh, I, I appreciate your time. And, uh, well, you're welcome to move to Austin. Austin. <laughs> you're, you're always welcome to move to Austin. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Live music, well, capital of the world, beautiful weather. All right, well, I'll consider it then. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Amy. We appreciate have, the call. Have a good night. Thanks. Too. And, and I'm still doing all the talking. That's all right. So, Debbie, how are you? Hi there. You're, you're from Florida, you? too. I'm good. Good. I'm tired. <laughs> I've been watching your program on YouTube, and I've been enjoying it very much. Well, thank you. And I thought I'd call because I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things that bother me uh, about religious people. And the first thing that bothers me about them is that when you tell them that you don't believe in God, they tell you to go read the Bible. And what, what puzzles me is that when, all you have to do is read the first few sentences of the Bible to know that this is a book of fiction. And what good is it going to do to read more of the Bible and, and, and read more stories of more fiction? How is that going to convince you that the Bible is, is, is true? Yeah, if, if, I, if I eat one bad apple and I throw up, how is, how is eating the whole barrel going to do me good? <laughs> yeah. So, 
So, you know, all you have to do is read the, the first few lines of Genesis, you know, God created the, the, the heavens and the earth in seven days, and, you know, you're, you're, if you have any, if, if you're using your, your good critical thinking skills, you know, hey, this is a book of fantasy because it defies the laws of physics. And then if you go on and read about the, you know, the, the rib and the apple and the snake and, and on and on, oh, well, animals. one pl fantasy plus one fantasy does not equal a reality. A fantasy plus a fantasy equals two fantasies. And it's just, you know, I apply the same logic as when I read, for example, Cinderella, and I, <laughs> and I read the, about the fairy godmother, and then I realize immediately, hey, this is a book of fantasy. I don't need to keep reading the book to realize that this is a book of fantasy and talk, you know, listen about the pumpkin and the coach and the, and the mice and the ho right, being changed into white horses. I get right away that this is a book of fantasy because it defies the laws of science. I, I, will, though, I will, though, say this. Um, for things like fables, um, there's a moral to the story. You do yes. get something out of it. But the point yes. is that that moral is true irrespective of the story. Yes. And it's truth is evident with no dependence upon the story. Yes. Yeah, it's true in whatever context is true. Correct. And it's not true in whatever context it's not true. That's yeah. right. Sorry. I'm, I'm, no, it's okay. I'm hearkening back to my <laughs> philosophical debate, but go ahead. I mean, I have, I have never read the Bible other than a few uh, words here and there because I was miraculously, if I may use the word, spared being raised in any kind of religious environment. My parents were not atheists that I know of. Um, I've never had a religious discussion with my parents ever, but uh, religion was never, ever mentioned in my family. So I never went to church, I never went to Sunday school, and I never read the Bible. And oddly enough, you're an atheist. Well, right. yes. And see, um, I did read the Bible, I did go to church, and I was raised really, really religious, and I am an atheist. That's right. So see, we got there two different paths. No, this is, yeah, this is making, two different paths. This is making me laugh because I um, responded to an email tonight, and one of the things somebody had said was something about people's inherent, um, like, want, like in, their inherent belief in a, a creator God. And I said, if people inherently believed in a creator God, why do we have to indoctrinate them as children? That's right. Um, if no. you don't indoctrinate them, maybe they don't. We won't know until people stop indoctrinating them. But I, I tried for years to find a religion that made sense to me, and I investigated several different religions, and none of them made sense. And finally I realized about a year ago, hey, I'm an atheist. And I'm, I'm kind of resentful that it, that it took this long to come to that realization because there's this atheist taboo in our culture. All right, Debbie, yeah. I got to cut you off. We only got 45 seconds left in the show. I understand the frustration. <laughs> I went through it as well. Um, and just you can, you can get over it because things happen and you are who you are because of it. There's the crew. Thanks to them. Thanks for everybody for being so patient. Thanks to everybody who sat through this long, drawn-out discussion. Um, we may or may not ever do this again depending on, on response. But uh, we'll be back again next week. Don't forget about the upcoming pub crawl. We'll be down at Threadgills, which I neglected to mention throughout the show, very shortly.